and welcome to Conversations with Matt DeLockery. In the last episode in this series, I want to talk about facts and faith. Specifically, there are two questions I want to cover. First, what is the difference between facts and faith? And second, should we trust science or Christianity? Now, many people will say that science is all about facts and Christianity is all about faith, so there really is no overlap between the two. They really operate in different worlds. And really, what role does faith have in a world of facts anyway? Or for that matter, what role do facts have in a world of faith? Doesn't each one get in the way of the other? Perhaps. But in order to address this, I want to start by looking at the sort of faith that the Bible tells us to have, because I think a lot of people get this wrong. I'm going to start with one of the most commonly used passages to say that Christians are told to have blind faith. John 20, verses 24 to 27 Say this. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, when you read this passage, it sounds like Jesus is telling Thomas they should have believed without having any proof, right? After all, Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. However, there are two things that are easy to miss with just a passing reading. First, Thomas wasn't like us. Thomas had just spent the last three years living with Jesus and ministering with him. He'd actually seen Jesus walk on water, make lame men walk and blind men see, cast out demons, and even raise the dead. We weren't physically present when Jesus did these things, so we don't have quite the same reason to believe that Thomas would have. When you think of it that way, you have to ask the question, how is it exactly that Thomas could have seen all that and not believed when the other disciples told him Jesus rose from the dead? And for that matter, He had as many as ten witnesses that he knew well, his fellow disciples, minus Judas, who had seen these same things and had been his fellow disciples for the last three years, telling him that this had happened. Thomas had more than enough evidence to believe. Jesus had been giving it to him for the last three years, and his fellow disciples told him that it had happened. If he couldn't believe after that, Thomas deserved to be criticized for his lack of faith. The second thing about this passage is that everyone stops with verse 29, but they don't bother to read the next two verses. Verses 30 to 31 say, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The author says that these things were written so that you may believe. In other words, he is writing to give the reader or listener the evidence necessary to have faith. You see, faith is not, as so many people want to say, believing in something you know isn't so. That's blind faith. Seeing faith is believing in something you have good reason to believe in, such that you act based on that knowledge. Having good reason to believe in something is the first part. Faith comes in when you act on what you have good reason to believe. This often means that you go down a path that you cannot see clearly. Perhaps you don't know where it will lead. Perhaps you don't know what the journey along the way will look like. But you have good reason to believe that you will get there, so you're willing to take a step out into the unknown. Faith isn't taking a chance or risk based on nothing. Faith is taking a chance or risk because you have good reason to trust either the someone or something that told you that it was okay. Now, this is not something that's unique to Christianity. We do this all the time in the non-religious world. We trust people. We trust that certain plans we have or directions that we choose to go in life will work out. 
The reason we do this, normally, is because we have good reason to. We have thought through the plans and think there is good reason to believe that they will work out. We have known certain people for a long time and know their character, so we have seen that they are reliable. This is the same thing that is going on with Christianity. We are asked to trust in what we have good reason to believe. We are asked to make choices about where to go, including down paths that are not well lit and look scary, because we trust the one who asks us to go there. This is why it is so important to make sure that Christianity is actually true. If it is not true, then we're deluding ourselves, and we're going to wind up in a pretty bad spot. You see, Christianity claims to be based on facts. It claims that God actually exists. It claims that Jesus actually rose from the dead. So, like science, Christianity is actually testable. You can look to see if it is true or not, and if it's not, then you should get rid of it. But, if it is true, then you should trust the one who created the world, came as a human, died, and rose from the dead. If he really is who he says he is, then we should trust that he knows what he's doing. But, that's why it's so important to check. We're not supposed to have blind faith, and the Bible most certainly does not tell us to. We're supposed to have faith that is based on evidence. But once we have the evidence, we're supposed to act on that faith. Really then, faith and facts are not separate. Blind faith and facts are separate. But faith and facts go together, whether we're talking science or Christianity or anything else. We should have faith in conclusions that are based on evidence. We should act on what we have good reason to think is true. Now for the second question. Should you trust science or Christianity? Now, this question assumes that the two are going to come into conflict. Most of the time, I don't think there's any conflict between the two, but occasionally there is. So, what do you do when they disagree with one another? Which one do you trust? From my perspective as a Christian, if I see science and Christianity saying two different things, I'm going to stop and re-examine all the data. Because of what I believe about the world, I don't think the two should ever come into conflict. So if they do, we've gone wrong somewhere. You see, what we read in the Bible is God's direct revelation to humanity. It tells the story of God and man and informs us of many things. Primarily, these are about the relationship between God and man. You know, the thing the story is about. But occasionally, the Bible does touch on things that science touches on. Now, many people view science as an endeavor completely separate from Christianity. For me, as a Christian, I view it as a study of God's creation. God made the world, and science is humanity's attempt to understand it. I think this is an excellent pursuit, and one that can be God-honoring. So why would these two ever come into conflict? The thing is that they really shouldn't. If Christianity is true, which is what we're assuming for the moment, what we know from the Bible and what we know from science should never conflict. If they do, that means we've gone wrong somewhere. That means we should do some investigation. Now, different people will want to say that we should automatically trust either one or the other. The more religious will say that we should automatically trust the Bible, while others, either more scientific, less religious, or both, would say that we should automatically trust science. I think both of these forget something. Both of these answers forget the imperfection inherent in each of their disciplines. Science is a discipline that is built around the updating and correction of theories as new information becomes available. As such, those who propose trusting science should remember that science is never finished with its task. It is always learning, it is always growing, and it is always correcting itself. It is difficult to say, science says this, with much hope of long-term accuracy. It is better to say, Science says this now, though it will possibly be modified or changed down the road. Maybe it will change a little. Maybe it will change a lot. The fact is that we don't know. And that should encourage a little humility. As far as Christianity, many Christians will respond, Science may change, but the Bible comes from God and is 100% correct. It will never be wrong. I completely agree with this statement. However, it is forgetting one thing. The person reading the Bible is often wrong. We Christians have gotten things wrong about the Bible more times than we can count. In this way, it's really similar to science. 
There are some things that we are pretty sure about, but there are other things that will be modified or changed down the road. Maybe our theology will change a little, maybe it will change a lot. Unless God has spoken to us directly and told us that our theology is completely perfect, not likely, then we should exercise a little humility. The fact is that neither the actual truth about the way the universe operates that we discover through science, nor the actual truth about humanity's relationship to God that God revealed to us through the Bible will ever come into conflict. Again, assuming Christianity itself is true. However, our understanding of those truths is always limited and imperfect. Given that the fault is with us, when we think we see a conflict between the two, rather than automatically preferring one or the other, I would suggest starting back at the beginning and reevaluating everything. Look back over all the evidence again and see what you come up with. So that concludes this brief series on science and Christianity. Perhaps, to some of your disappointments, we didn't address specific questions like the Big Bang Theory and evolution. We talked about consistency, and in the first episode of this series, I already said that I think Christianity and the first couple chapters of Genesis are consistent with the Big Bang Theory and evolution, and I tried to show why I think that's the case. But I never addressed the question, what actually did happen back then? I plan to do a whole series on the origin of the universe, and probably one on Genesis as well, but we're not going to cover those now. We're just looking at a general perspective. I may or may not ever cover evolution, we'll just have to see. Really what I wanted to communicate is that science and Christianity are not at odds, and then touch on some of the points of conflict and show that there's not as much reason to think that science and Christianity can't get along as many people think there is. Again, this has been an introduction to science and Christianity. We'll go over some specific issues in detail in later series. If you want to go over this question in more depth, check out the book I mentioned in the first episode. I put a link to it in the description of this episode as well. Also, remember to listen to the interviews following this series that get a couple of scientists' perspectives on some of these issues. I hope they're helpful to you. 